Hey there, and welcome back to Mass Effect 3. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our Insanity walkthrough. After thoroughly exploring the Citadel in the last episode, today we are taking a closer look at the once again improved Normandy, and we will also complete a short mission at the end, just to bring some action back to the series. Now, at the end of the last video, we briefly talked to Liara, we also met up with Specialist Trainer, and we were briefed on the next storyline mission by Admiral Hackett. Today, our tour through the ship begins with a closer look at those mysterious war assets, for which we actually have our very own war terminal over here. Jumping in, we receive a brief overview, although that second sentence about the galactic readiness can safely be ignored in the Legendary Edition. That was a feature back in the original Mass Effect 3 and it related in part to the game's multiplayer. Like I said at the beginning of the series though, that feature has been removed, and so now the numbers behind the war assets are very simple. The more we have, the better off we will be. Although, without spoiling anything, for the best possible outcome it is also not necessary to acquire every last war asset out there, so we can at times sacrifice some points in favor of decisions that are a bit more fitting in regards to the overall storyline, such as recruiting Dr. Chakwas instead of Dr. Michelle, for example. At the bottom left you can see that, of course, at this point we don't have nearly enough, but we can still learn a thing or two about the few assets that we do have. Now, quick disclaimer, most of the assets listed here we of course did not actively recruit ourselves, as these are alliance assets that are on our side no matter what. The individual strength of these war assets, represented by the points right next to them, does vary a bit of course. However, taking a closer look at the alliance 1st, 3rd and 5th fleets, we can see that they are not actually at their full strength because of a decision that we made back in Mass Effect 1, when we decided to save the Citadel Council. The Alliance fleets lost a good number of ships in that fight, and so these three assets are now at 65 instead of 100 points. However, the Council is of course also still alive, and I'm sure that has a few advantages for us as well. We can also see here the recently recruited Diana Alice, as well as our very own Normandy. And because of all those upgrades that we installed on the Normandy over the course of Mass Effect 2, the ship's strength as a war asset has now been significantly increased. In addition to that, we also recovered a hefty amount of mineral resources in Mass Effect 2, which gets us a further 100 points here, 10 times the amount we get for staying on the good side of Kalisa al Jelani. Now again, over the course of this series we will of course add to this quite a bit. As a matter of fact, we will continue to do so right here in today's episode. Before we get to that, however, let us continue our tour. There is nothing more to see in this room, but in the next one we can grab the first of several collectibles in this episode, in the form of an Alliance shuttle ship model. Yes, those make a return in Mass Effect 3, and we are not starting from scratch. This here is the first of many that we'll find scattered around the ship. I can't believe the Council won't help. Come on, Sarah. If Thessia was lost and Earth hadn't been touched yet, you can be damn sure we'd be guarding our own borders. And with that, we have made it to a section of the ship that should be all too familiar. However, we are saving the galaxy map and specialist trainer for later. For now, let's make a beeline straight to the cockpit for our first, albeit rather brief, chat with everyone's favorite pilot. Hey, Commander. You know, I had my doubts about the Council. But after years of ignoring your warnings, they're finally willing to step up and tell you they just can't help. Now, we cannot obtain any morality points here, so we can safely voice our frustration with the Council. After all, Joker is among the longest-serving crew members who I think we can be open and honest with. They've spent years denying the threat. You think they'd be prepared now? I was kind of hoping that maybe they were planning in secret and just not telling you about it because, you know, Cerberus. Well, let me know if you want me to get them on the channel and then hang up on them, you know, for old time's sake. And a bit of a callback to Mass Effect 1 here, which is interesting considering we never actually hung up on the Council. But then again, it is one of those things that is just very hard to resist. Commander, the Alliance has found a new Cerberus lab on Sanctum. Admiral Hackett would like you to investigate. Alright, and just like that, we have received ourselves a new mission. But, like I said, we will come back to all of that at a later point in the episode. For now, let's take the elevator and travel one level down to the crew deck. Now, right as we enter, we find ourselves in front of the Normandy Memorial Wall, which includes a few familiar names, like Charles Presley, Richard Jenkins, and of course, Ashley Williams. 
Immediately to the right of that we have life support, although of course Thane is no longer to be found here. Instead, just around the corner here we can pick up the ship model of the Destiny Ascension. Heading back out we have the men's restrooms right ahead of us, but there is nothing to interact with here. And at least for the moment the same is also true for the port observation deck, where we find a lovely view, a poker table and a bar, but again at least for the moment nobody actually using any of that. So we can continue straight away with the crew quarters, which do have some life inside of them, but unfortunately no conversations to listen to. The starboard observation deck is then once again empty, nothing here, except for a pretty nice view. At this point though, it is high time for our next conversation, and we actually just brought her back on board in the last episode. I am of course talking about Dr. Chakwas. Commander. Everything okay down here, Doctor? The Alliance team cleaned up and restocked, but it's still my old med bay. Feels like home. Welcome back. Thank you. Let's waste no time. If I may, I'd like to examine you. Nothing wrong with me, is there? No, but we should keep an eye on all those cybernetic implants Cerberus grafted into you. Expensive stuff bringing me back. And worth every penny. Let's just make sure everything is okay. And, just like with Joker earlier, no morality points here, but we know the doctor well by now, so let's simply go through with the procedure. Guess a checkup never hurts. Just no scalpel this time, Doc. Alas, to my great disappointment, it is nothing invasive. I'm just going to run some diagnostics on your implants, and it'll take a few readings. The procedure we did for your scarring has produced a lovely synthetic protein overlay, and your body has accepted the implants quite nicely. It a better. Sure didn't come cheap. That's it. You're the picture of health. We can also ask a small set of questions now, as usual ranging from professional to personal. How's our inventory of meds? The med bay was fully stocked before you left Earth. We should be good for a long time, even given the amount of fire you take each day. Do you ever regret working for Cerberus? We didn't work for them. We used them. If I were to feel anything, it would be guilt. We took their money, took their best people, took their best ship. We used them to defeat the Collectors, and now we are using their resources against them. So no, I don't regret it one bit. You've never mentioned any of your family. None to speak of, really. I'm the last of a prestigious line of medical professionals. The Alliance is my spouse. And you're all my children. I'm blessed with many close friends. But with each Alliance vessel taken, I lose one or two. We need to end this war. And well, I think that is something that we can all agree on. So let's leave Chakwas to her work and move on now. I'll see you around, Doctor. Take care, Shepard. Also here in the Mad Lab we have the option to reassign our bonus powers, which we actually don't have yet, and we can also respec the powers for Shepard and all of his squad members, but again, no need for that right now. Back in the AI core we then also find the charred body of Dr. Eva Corre, for now life and motionless, but perhaps that is going to change in the near future. Heading back out, there are no more conversations to overhear and we are also not going to make the long walk down to the main battery. Once again, at least for the moment, there is absolutely nothing to be found there. So instead, let's pay a visit to Liara next. Commander Shepard, it's a pleasure to see you again. You're the drone from the Shadow Brokers ship. Dr. Tassoni now refers to me as Glyph instead of Info Drone 95% of the time. If you have a moment, I'd like to draw your attention to a terminal in her office. It analyzes information packages. If you find any useful data, I can research upgrades for you. And what should I be looking for? I'll inform you if you found relevant data. When you do, return to this terminal for your choices. In the meantime, Dr. Tassoni would like to speak with you. Have a pleasant day. Meeting with the council didn't go too well, huh? It was less than ideal. Yeah, I'm shocked. At least the council can't deny the Reapers exist. But I'm not sure how much comfort that is while they bicker over which portion of the galaxy to save. Wow. Becoming the big 
info brokers turned you into a real cynic, Liara. I like it. I'm flattered. I think. And of course, before we interact with any of the terminals, let's talk to Liara herself. Looks like you brought more than just that drone from your ship. A few things were necessary. I'd be a very silent shadow broker without data feeds. So you have access to your resources? What I can get. We'll need it to research this Prothean device. Until we understand precisely what it does, it's far too dangerous to use. Did the Protheans actually complete this weapon? You mean, will it work? They wouldn't have poured their last resources into this device if they thought otherwise. But we really need to find out just what kind of weapon they left us. And again, we cannot obtain any morality points here, but let's go with the Paragon option in spirit nonetheless. It'd be nice to know we're not kids playing around with a loaded gun. Absolutely. The damage it could cause if it backfired is unthinkable. This will be difficult even for us. If something happens on a mission, if either one of us are hurt... Shepard, there's something I need to ask before we go any further. I know you and Tally grew close. Is that in the past? Should I forget there was anything between us? Right, so this might seem like an unexpectedly early point in the game to make this decision, but don't worry, it does not lock us into a romance with Liara just yet. That is also why we are in fact going to respond positively here. Yes, Shepard's latest romantic pursuit is actually Tali, but who knows when or even if we are going to see her in this game, while Liara is currently here and very much interested. Now, apart from this perhaps somewhat far-fetched in-game justification, there is of course also the completionist aspect, and in that sense we are going to take whatever we can get, just for the sake of adding as much story as possible to the playthrough. I didn't forget you, Liara. I want to make us work. Good. I was getting worried. There were a lot of reasons I was happy to see you on Mars. I'd like that list, but later? There's so much left to do. I'm working with Edie, hopefully we can discover what the Protheans left for us. But I'm looking forward to talking about something other than business. Maybe later? Right, now at this point it seems like our conversation with Liara is over, but it actually isn't. If we talk to her a second time, she does in fact have quite a few more things to share. Hello again, Shepard. And most of the options here actually revolve around Liara's occupation as the Shadow Broker, a job that is perhaps not quite so easy to pull off from inside just a single office. What's been happening with you as the Broker, Liara? It's been exciting. The old Broker's ship, Impressive, but it was never meant to be space-worthy. Which meant the elusive man eventually tracked me down on Hagalaz. What happened? I knew he was coming. Ferran and I loaded as much of the ship's specialized hardware onto a shuttle as we could. We got away from Cerberus's ships after arranging an appropriate distraction. What kind of distraction? Sending the broker's ship exploding into a Cerberus cruiser. I don't think the elusive man expected me to give up my resources in such a spectacular fashion. Can you still operate as the broker without the ship? Well, I couldn't let the elusive man have it. I saved what was crucial. My network of agents is intact, although the Reapers have taken a toll on their numbers. It's taking a while to re-establish contact. So where is Farron if you two escaped? He convinced me he was recovered enough to work. And I do need more agents. Agent Farron didn't report any injuries during his last call to your doctor. True. Given what he survived, I should probably worry less. You brought your little helper with you? Its name is Glyph. It helped sort through all the data that led me to the Archive on Mars. It was a pleasure to be of assistance, Doctor. Glyph's interfaced with the data feeds. Its analytical software should come in handy. What have you been up to since we last saw each other? Since you helped me defeat the Shadow Broker, I started looking for defenses against the Reapers. The Protheans were the only ones with substantial information on them. The older civilizations barely had records. I knew the elusive man was hunting for the same thing when our agents began crossing paths. Like on Mars? I thought I'd covered my tracks, but he had surveillance there all along. How much do you know about this Prothean artifact? Very little. We're fortunate enough data survived to piece together the blueprints. Decoding them will require as many specialists as we can find. It's that high-tech? 
I'd have killed for a glimpse of it during graduate school. So Liara just underlined the importance of finding those tech specialists, in the form of war assets of course. For the time being though, she has nothing more to share with us. We'll talk later, Liara. Of course. So, up next, let us now take a look at the broken terminal. This terminal contains non-essential correspondence from your allied forces. Dr. Tassoni has granted you access. Now, of the two terminals in Liara's office, this is perhaps the slightly less interesting one, at least when it comes to actual effects on the game. The first entry here, titled Prothean Notes, is a bit of a research journal. It actually starts documenting Liara's work on the Protheans about a decade before the events of Mass Effect 1. It then briefly mentions Liara's expedition to Therum, where we first met her. It also describes her fascination with Commander Shepard himself, shortly after Liara has taken over as the Shadow Broker, and roughly one year before the beginning of Mass Effect 3. The second entry is a bit shorter, it is a message from Liara's assistant and operative Farron, who alongside a few other Shadow Broker operatives is apparently scouting the Terminus systems for intel and materials for the Crucible, although he also reports that things could perhaps be going better. Now moving on to the intel terminal, this is where we can actually do something, as a more accurate description would probably be upgrade terminal, because we can use this terminal to select various small improvements. And because we completed the Lair of the Shadow Broker DLC, one of those upgrades is already available to us here, and it presents us with a rather easy choice in my opinion. Ammunition is usually readily available in this game, and if it isn't you can normally plan for that, while there will be very few moments in this game where a shield strength bonus is not going to be useful, so that is the upgrade that we're going with, and over the course of the series many more will follow. Please enjoy your day. And that also completes our tour of the crew deck, which means it is time to return to the elevator and once again take it one level down. Our next stop is engineering. Now as we arrive, we can first turn to the right here towards the starboard cargo hold, where Diana Alice has gotten herself all set up, so let's have a quick chat with her about how her work is going. How's your new assignment working out, Alers? Fairly normal, except for the unshackled AI, Matriarch Benezia's daughter, and the communicator that can reach Earth? The first two, I can deal with. That last one gets my attention. So what are you asking for, exactly? Anything from Earth is the lead story right now. That's not opinion, it's fact. Maybe I can pass on a few non-classified progress updates. Seriously? You just doubled my ratings. I don't need FaceTime, just a data upload. And this time we can actually obtain two Paragon Points by focusing on getting us support. I think our issues with Cerberus are very much personal, so let's have her coverage focus on the bigger picture. Tell people what's really happening on Earth. We need long recruiting lines on every planet after you air a story. I can do this, Commander. Remind me to tell you about the time I made an Elcor cry. Alright, quick and easy, and she also does not have anything more to tell us, at least not for the moment. So let's continue exploring, and up next we're heading downstairs into the cargo hold where we usually had our talks with Jack, and while we collect a few more model ships here, we are also eagerly listening for one particular sound. There it is, just a small beep, but it signals us that a space hamster is running around, and if we're quick enough, we can actually catch it. Once that has been achieved, let's collect the third ship model and then head back upstairs. We are now continuing on to the drive core, where we are about to meet a familiar face back from Mass Effect 1. Commander, welcome back to the Normandy. Or maybe you should be saying that to me. Engineer Adams, what are you doing here? I was put in charge of the drive core retrofits. My experience on the Normandy SR-1 made me an obvious choice. So, what do you think of our SR-2? She's incredible. If there's one nice thing I can say about Cerberus, it's that they know how to build a ship. And about that, Cerberus, I mean. I owe you an apology. How so? Back when you got this ship, Dr. Chalk was contacting me, asking me to help with your mission against the Collectors. I refused. I didn't have your back, and I'm sorry for that. Why didn't you join us? I saw what happened to you when the Normandy went down. I didn't trust that it was really you, and I certainly didn't trust Cerberus. Also, as an officer of the Alliance, I don't just leave my post, you know? And again, no morality points here, but it sure can't hurt to be friendly. 
So no, there is no need to apologize. Your alliance first. That's the way it should be. Thank you, Commander. Glad to be aboard. And of course, Adams will also have to answer a few questions about himself. Sorry that our tour is taking a while, but we are playing this game for full completion. Does the new Normandy stack up to the old SR-1? <laughs> stack up? It blows the old ship away. The Tantalus drive core has been completely overhauled. The SR-2 might be nearly twice the size, but the new drive core is three times bigger. This ship can fly. That said, Cerberus isn't too high on safety. If pushed past her limits, this core would vent into engineering. Guess it gives my team incentive to keep her well balanced during a firefight. Do your job or get vaporized. Pretty much. I noticed you upgraded the kinetic barriers with cyclonic technology. Should help reduce the draw when under missile fire. Hopefully that means fewer vaporized engineers? The IES stealth system is significantly improved. It can handle a higher blue shift of our emissions. And that means? We should be able to drop out of FTL without triggering every sensor in range. Very handy for stealth reconnaissance. All in all, the Normandy is a marvel of engineering. What do you think of Edie? We had a good talk during the retrofit. A little strange at first, talking shop with an AI. AI? I thought Edie posed as a VI to keep the likes of you from unplugging her. Yeah, but I saw through her. Have you seen her hardware? Processing power is off the charts. And then there were the problems that kept fixing themselves. If I hadn't had her pegged, I would have sworn I was losing it. You never expressed any skepticism, Lieutenant Adams. I figured I'd better play it safe with the Cerberus AI, Edie. No offense. None taken. As long as you keep your fingers out of my cognizance processors. <laughs> In the beginning, I tried disconnecting her from key processes without giving myself away. Easier said than done. But Joker seemed to trust her. And in time, I saw her advantages. Even grew to like her. Is your family okay? My parents are serving on Viridian Zenith, an Alliance agricultural vessel. My sister is a navigator on the SSV Benjamin Davis. Happy to report that both vessels are safely under Hackett's command. And well, that is good to hear. Let's hope that our command achieves the same result. Carry on, Adams. Aye, aye, sir. And there we go, no need to visit the drive core again, I think. We just saw that during our conversation, at least briefly. And so, we are now actually done with the engineering deck as well, and can head down to the very bottom of the ship, to the shuttle bay. Now, as we arrive, we immediately want to head for the crates on the right side here, because in between those we can find two more model ships, a Geth cruiser and an Alliance cruiser. Moving on, we then pass by an armor locker that we are not going to interact with just yet. Instead, we can have a chat with our shuttle pilot, Lieutenant Cortez. Lieutenant Steve Cortez, shuttle pilot. Got news about our supply chains, Commander. And with Cortez, we can once again obtain two Paragon points by telling him to be at ease. After all, we are one big family here. Nice to meet you, Lieutenant. What's going on? Sorry to just jump in, Commander. There's so much to be done, I get caught up in the tasks at hand. He's always like that. You need to chill out, Esteban. So you do care, Mr. Vega? Or is that the Cerveza talking again? So what's happening with our supply chains, Lieutenant? Alliance procurement chains are in chaos, but the Citadel's economy is still running. I can network to Citadel retailers. You can view inventory and make purchases right from this console. When I network to a new store, I'll let you know. It does cost more to coordinate delivery to the Normandy, so it's cheaper to buy supplies when you're there. So you're my shuttle pilot, but you're setting up procurement chains? I wasn't assigned as Normandy's pilot. Not much need for one on a dry dot ship. I was overseeing the retrofit of the cargo hold. I'm quite familiar with the operation and maintenance of the UT-47 Kodiak and the M-44 Hammerhead. From my experience, it made sense for me to take over as shuttle pilot when we left Earth. Especially given Mr. Vega's love of mid-air collisions. To save the day, pendejo! I'm also responsible for logistics, making sure the armory and shuttle are properly stocked and maintained. Alright, quite a bit of dialogue there, and Cortez actually also has a good number of questions that we can ask him. So let's learn a bit more about what he actually does and how he ended up doing it. How long have you been with the Alliance? About 10 years. I enlisted in First Fleet serving on the SSV Hawking, flying F-61 Tridents mostly. I love the Trident, it practically dances in low atmo. I spent as much time tinkering on my bird as flying her. Got a bit of a reputation. 
So, you can fly fighters and fix them? Yeah. And I got a knack for procurement, too. They were grooming me for CAG, but my skill set made me more valuable commanding a flight deck. They assigned me to the Normandy Retrofit team about five months ago to oversee all cargo bay modifications. You were stationed on Earth. Do you have family there? I'm an only child. Lost my parents years ago. I had a husband back when I was stationed at Ferris Fields. The Collectors took out the whole colony. I'd rather not talk about it. Do you maintain this armory? I share that duty with our illustrious Mr. Vega. Though I believe the only weapon he really cares to maintain is himself. You know you love the show, Esteban. <laughs> the first retrofit we did was to move the armory down from Deck 2. I'm not sure what Cerberus engineers were thinking. Now you get off the elevator, pick your gear, and head right into the shuttle. Just like the original Normandy. Welcome back to the Alliance, Commander. The Kodiak seems a bit different. Good eyes, Commander. This is the UT-47A Kodiak. It's got an upgraded ESO core and prototype stealth technology based on the Normandy design. For quick drops, I can get you in and out virtually undetected. She flies like a brick, so that's why you need a good pilot. What happened to the M44 Hammerhead? <laughs> it was sent to the tech labs for a retrofit. To afford mobility with such a small ESO core, its design sacrificed armor plating. The lab engineers are trying to improve that. After the Reaper invasion, those labs are probably just a pile of rubble. Alright, sounds like Cortez is a man of many talents, so let's leave him in peace for the time being. Keep up the hard work, but don't kill yourself. Yes, Commander. Now, as we take note of an interesting robotic creature waddle past, we can also take a closer look at the procurement interface. But, like Cortez mentioned earlier, buying stuff here comes with a 10% price increase, so we are not going to do that anytime soon. Right next to that, we then have the weapons upgrade terminal, not to be confused with a weapons bench, as this is where we can actually purchase level ups, if you will, for any of the weapons that we currently have. At this point in the game, though, we not only just have access to some of the most basic weapons in the game, but we are also a little bit short on funds, so for the moment I don't see any particularly worthwhile investments here. Now that brings us to the weapons bench, where we can upgrade our weapons with attachments like scopes or magazine upgrades, but again, no need for that at this point, so instead let's loop around the corner here and pick up the ship model of the freighter. At this point, we only have two more to go, a quarian ship model in the crates over here, and then a model of the Normandy SR-1 over on the other side. And with that, the collection is complete, at least for now. Time to have another chat, this time with James. Hey, Shepard. How'd it go with the council? Same as usual. Non-committal. Unhelpful. Bet they still wanted you to help them out, no? Yeah. We're gonna rescue a Turian Primarch from Palavan. <sighs> Sounds like fun. Never been to the Turian homeworld. <sighs> you down here for a reason? <sighs> and yes, again, there are no morality points to be gained here. At the same time, though, we are also not going to build a relationship by being needlessly confrontational. Just came down to talk. Great. <clears throat> Not sure what there is to talk about. <clears throat> you already know my service record. <clears throat> I don't, actually. I didn't have access to personnel records when we met. Right. Forgot about that. <clears throat> well... <clears throat> Think you can dance and talk at the same time? And indeed, we are down to dance, our first short minigame, if you will. And even though it may look like it in a moment, no, it won't give us any morality points either. I think I can handle it. Okay, loco. Let's dance. Don't push your luck, Vega. With age comes wisdom. And rank. Ha! You sound like my old CO. <laughs> oh yeah? And who was that? Captain Tony. He was a hard-ass son of a bitch, but a good leader. <sighs> nice. <clears throat> what do you mean, was? Died. With most of my squad. 
protecting a civilian colony from a collector attack. And the colony? It was either them or the intel we had on the collectors. Intel we could have used to destroy them. I chose the intel. Sorry. That's a tough call. The best part was, we didn't really need the intel in the end. Because you were out saving the galaxy by taking down the entire Collector homeworld. You didn't know. You can't blame yourself, Vega. Who says I'm blaming myself? I do. You a shrink too? Nope. But that stunt back on Mars was reckless. You're lucky to be alive. So? So? Maybe you don't care if you live or die. Or maybe... <clears throat> I'm just willing to do whatever the fuck it takes to end this goddamn war! <clears throat> maybe you are. But if you're half as good as I think you are, we need you alive. Thanks for the pep talk. Anytime. Hey, thanks for the dance, loco. All right, and after a few well-timed interruptions, without any moral consequences, of course, we have now earned ourselves a nickname and one that we are going to embrace. Loco, huh? I can think of worse things to call you. As long as you remember who's in charge, you can call me whatever you want. Oh, I won't forget. Right, so this conversation with James has actually just unlocked our very first bonus power, but there are also better ones to be had, just like a second conversation with the man himself. Hey again, what's up? And just like with Liara earlier, after getting the mandatory stuff out of the way, we now have the option to ask a few more questions, and being a fully-fledged squad member, I think we do well to learn all that we can about James. You had a hard time leaving Earth. You still want to head back? Hell yeah. But I get it now. It's not where I'd be most useful. Not yet, anyway. We'll get back there. I know. And I'll do whatever it takes to get us there, Commander. Maybe no more shuttle crashes. No promises now that I've gotten the taste for it. Besides, I like to keep Esteban on his toes. I take it you and Lieutenant Cortez know each other. Yeah, Esteban did a stint on Fell Prime where me and my squad were stationed. I caught up with him on Earth a few months back. He's a good guy. Just don't tell him I said so. It'd go to his head. You got family back on Earth? Yeah, an uncle. Retired military. Got a few cousins I haven't heard from in a while. You and your uncle close? Yep. He was the reason I joined the Marines and was about the only good thing in my life after my mom died. No dad? He's there. Somewhere. But I'm not sure I'd call him family. Not anymore. I would like to find out how my uncle's doing, though. You mentioned a mission you had against the Collectors. What happened? Pretty much what I said. Things went foobar and I was one of the few to make it out. If you want the rest of the story, you're gonna have to get me really drunk, or... Or what? That's about it. Sorry, Commander. Just not interested in talking about that. Next topic? What's with you and the nicknames? It's just my way of remembering people. Some people just don't match their names, you know? So, I just give them a new one. So, I'm a loco, huh? Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty crazy, but the shit you've done <laughs> makes me look sane. Well, whether you like the nickname or not, it is hard to argue with that, so we are not even going to try and instead leave the man be. I'll talk to you later. You bet. Sounds like the Turians got hit pretty hard by the Reapers. So, the Turians want us to go find one of their politicians, huh? Well, maybe we'll get to kick some Reaper ass while rescuing the Primarch. A few more comments then on our next main storyline mission, which we are not actually going to jump into today. Instead, we are now wrapping up our tour with a visit to Shepard's very own captain's cabin. The first thing we notice as we enter is that our aquarium is empty, but don't worry about that. Instead, let us briefly marvel at our recently reclaimed ship collection, and we can also see that our space hamster has found a tiny home for itself. Also on the desk, we have Shepard's private terminal, so let's take a closer look at that, with the first of eight messages being from Admiral Hackett himself, 
telling us about that Cerberus lab that Specialist Trainer also mentioned earlier. In essence, this is our very first side mission or assignment if you will, and this one we are actually going to complete here today in just a few moments. The next message, also from Hackett, is just a confirmation that we are in fact now the commander of the Normandy. And at the end of the message, we are also granted diplomatic authority to establish treaties with non-human races. The next entry then is an emergency message from Alliance Fleet Operations to all Alliance military personnel. Basically, a galaxy-wide order to evacuate Earth and not approach under any circumstances, while those forces remaining on Earth are basically given free reign to defend themselves in any way they see fit. Message number 4 then explains the presence of that robotic canine that we just saw in the shuttle bay. It is apparently a so-called dog mac left on board by a certain Andrea Brown, a contractor who worked on the Normandy before we took over, and who just seems to have forgotten about it. Message number 5 is an article from the Alliance News Network, which brings up a topic that we already discussed in the last episode, namely the Quarian absence from the fight against the Reapers. However, we also know the reason why, as the Quarians are supposedly mounting an offensive against the Geth. In the next message, Edie then tells us that she has left us a welcome back gift, specifically a commemorative N7 hooded jacket, which we can actually take a closer look at in our armor locker in just a second. The second to last message then comes from Liara's drone glyph, but we have already taken care of the upgrade mentioned here. Finally then, the last message gives us another priority mission on the familiar planet of Eden Prime no less, and this mission actually belongs to the From Ashes DLC, which has been integrated into the Mass Effect 3 Legendary Edition. It is once again a mission with Cerberus involvement, who have apparently found a major Prothean artifact on Eden Prime, so that is something that should definitely pique our interest as well. Now, with all of that out of the way and our journal updated, let us now take a look at the armor locker, where we can, as promised, first take a look at the grand total of six sets of casual outfits available to us, with the aforementioned N7 hoodie being number five. For the moment though, I think we'll stick with the default. For our combat armors, we only have one other set at the moment, and that would be the Cerberus armor. This one part of the Alternate Appearance Pack DLC, and stats-wise actually quite serviceable, although for the next mission we are going to stick with the default here as well. That default being the N7 armor, which we can quickly make a little bit more protective by toggling on the helmet, and no, don't worry, this will not affect conversations. And we can also immediately give up that health bonus again in favor of some shield regeneration, thanks to the Casa Fabrication chest piece that we obtained on Mars. Also on Mars, we grab the Ariaki Technology Arms, but we don't really need extra melee damage at the moment, so for this slot we are going to stick with the N7 default. And with that, we have finally made it. This is just about it. Our tour through the Normandy is about to be completed with one final conversation. And for that one, we head back down to the CIC and speak to Specialist Trainer. Commander, come to check on your new recruit. Just wanted to see how you were doing. Still trying to get my bearings. When I was working on the Normandy's upgrades, I left at the end of the day. I didn't even have a toothbrush or a change of clothing until I made some emergency purchases on the Citadel. And at this point, I think I've said this a few times now, no morality points here, but there is also no need to be rude to her. Next time you need something, just ask. We're all in this together. Oh, it, it, it's no trouble, Commander. I'm sure you have larger concerns. We can put in a requisition order. My toothbrush is a Scission Promark 4. It uses tiny mass effect fields to break up plaque and massage the gums. It costs 6,000 credits. Okay, yeah. You're on your own with that. In any event, I appreciate you giving me the chance to stay. Was there anything else? And after our rather brief chat in the last episode, we can get a few more answers out of her today. And I think we should. After all, it looks like we will be working closely together. I'm surprised you're worrying about a toothbrush. We've got bigger problems right now. Oh, believe me. Seeing the Reapers on Earth was terrifying but I won't help anybody by bursting into tears here in the CIC, will I? Being here on the Normandy helps. If anyone in the galaxy can stop the Reapers, it's you. And if flagging your messages and managing strategic intel helps you in any way, then it's worth it. Where are you from originally? A colony in the Terminus systems, actually. Though I studied on Earth, at Oxford. My parents were from London. They loved Earth, but they wanted the freedom a colony life could offer. If they stayed in London, I imagine they'd be dead right now. A lot of people back on Earth are still alive. 
and counting on us. Quite true, Commander. How'd you end up in the military, anyway? My family didn't have money for university. When the Alliance saw my aptitude scores, they offered me a full scholarship. I served my required years after graduation and decided to stay. I really like the challenges of the lab. Al although, I'm sure I'll grow to love frontline service as well. You worked in Alliance R&D? Yes. You'd think quantum entanglement would make communication easy, but imagine incorporating multiple incoming sources and then networking them with extrapolations of time lag data to construct a coherent situation GUI. It's an exciting challenge. Um, for me, anyway. And, well, let's hope that exciting doesn't turn into suicidal too quickly. For the moment, at least, though, we are done here. Carry on, Specialist. And with that, after about 40 minutes, we are now finally ready to access the galaxy map for the first time in the series. Now, with the galaxy under attack from the Reapers, some of the systems here have been marked as conquered. We can still travel to them, but it's not entirely risk-free. And one such conquered system is Sigurd's Cradle, where the Cerberus lab that we just learned about is located, so that is where we are going. Right, so introducing the search and rescue feature. In Mass Effect 3, we thankfully no longer have to scan each and every single individual planet. Instead, we can use the Normandy scanning pulse while we're in the galaxy map, which then detects objects of interest in a larger radius around us. I found something. And those can still be on planets like Watson, as you see here, but they could also be floating around somewhere else in space. Now, as we take a look at Watson's description here, I have to admit, I have not fully decided yet how we are going to go about the whole visiting planets thing in this series, because unlike in Mass Effect 2, there are a good number of planets that we have absolutely no reason to ever visit, except of course for reading through their description. That does of course not make for the most exciting content, so feel free to let me know in the comments how you would like to see me handle this. In the meantime, we have recovered some war assets from Watson in the form of Javelin missile launchers. These are worth 50 points and are the first of 10 resources that we need to gather this way for the Lost and Found achievement. Now, there is one more point of interest available here in the Skepsis system, but we'll leave that for later. Instead, we can now burn some fuel and head over to the neighboring Decorus system. Moving into the middle here, we can scan and immediately detect both objects of interest in the system. Signal confirmed. The first one located on the planet Lena. Now, also worth noting, I think, is that we will not only be finding war assets this way, sometimes we can also obtain quest items or intel for the terminal in Liara's office, or in this case, 10,000 good old credits. The next point of interest is then a wreckage, allowing us to recover some fuel. This tops up our capacity, but does not actually count towards the lost and found achievement. For that one, we need to recover stuff using the Normandy's probes. And with that, the Decorus system has been thoroughly scouted, which now brings us to Sanctum. For now, all that we know is that Cerberus is here, probably well hidden on a planet that does have a few sizable colonies, but is in large parts not really habitable thanks to frequent ice storms. So, let's touch down and we have no other choice here but to take Liara and James with us. However, even in the squad selection screen here, we can make some small changes. At the moment, you can see it here, Liara receives a 25% power damage bonus thanks to her armor, but due to the integration of the alternate appearance packs in the Legendary Edition, we have a few more outfits to choose from, some of which actually give her a different bonus. Now, some of them do admittedly look a bit goofy, but the second one here, that is what we will be going with, as it gives Liara an arguably a little bit more useful power recharge speed bonus. Same story then for James, he currently receives a 25% shield bonus, and he also has a good number of outfits to choose from, with interesting choices among them. And we are going with this one here for a 25% weapon damage bonus. Now, that brings us to our weapon loadout, which for Shepard will remain the same. We are going into this one with a sniper rifle and a pistol. We did obtain a few upgrades for the sniper rifle though, so let's quickly attach those. With an extended barrel, we can increase our damage output by 15%, and with a concentration mod, we can get a further 5% damage bonus, as well as a short time dilation effect, which should make aiming a little easier. Now, that is Shepard's loadout. For James, we are going with an assault rifle and a shotgun, although we are switching from the default Avenger to the recently acquired Vindicator, and for the shotgun, we can also add a few attachments. 
Now Liara's loadout remains the same as before with an SMG and a pistol and with that we can move on to spending a few squad points. Now with Shepard we currently only have two and we'll save those. With Liara we don't have any and that brings us to James. All of his six points will now go into the first three ranks of Arms Master, a passive power that increases both his offensive as well as defensive capabilities with a pretty substantial bonus to health, shield and weapon damage. And that's it, our preparations are complete, time to jump into the mission. Commander, I've got a hail from Admiral Hackett. Put him through, Lieutenant. Shepard, we've uncovered a secret service lab, function unknown. We sent in a recon team, but they were forced to pull out before they got very far. Any other intel? We think they're using the facility to warehouse and study Reaper tech. We've been wondering how service is connected to the Reapers, and this might give us some answers. We're on it. Find out what Cerberus is doing and get me any Reaper tech samples you can, Commander. Hack it out. On my way. Alright, quick second here to set up our hotkeys and weapons, and then we are good to go. Yep. Now, the first artifact has already been marked for us, and we can see that it's guarded, but before we get closer, we can grab a few credits just lying around here. Down the stairs, we can then see what these artifacts look like, but we can't interact with this one. Instead, we can read a log entry from a person shortly after they arrived here, waiting for their integration procedure. Back on Mars, we learned that Cerberus is using ReaperTech to augment their soldiers, so that is likely what is referred to here. Moving on, we now head to the right here and into a small room with another artifact that we can't use, but with a Metagel experiment that we can examine closer. <laughs> will only lead to Metagel advances for Hanar. Only Cerberus would call that a failure. Right, now this actually unlocks a small side quest, but we'll worry about that later. Instead, we can now loop around to the other side of the landing platform, grab a sniper rifle upgrade and begin the fight. Immediately afterwards, we can quickly dash to a console for another 3000 credits and then stay in cover while we dodge enemy fire and grenades. The enemies in this area are already familiar. We are facing the standard Cerberus assault troopers as well as one shielded centurion, so nothing special or terribly difficult yet. The main challenge in this fight is that it takes place in relatively close quarters, so there is not a lot of room to retreat or move into more advantageous positions, but then again that can also work in our favor as our enemies are often clustered together and therefore pretty vulnerable to Liara's singularity. So all in all, if we are just a bit patient, this group should not give us too much trouble. And indeed, the fight is quickly won, we are still at full health and have therefore no need for a medkit just yet. Still, we can loot the medical station for XP here and then read the second of Talavi's log entries, this one written after the integration was performed, with its author sounding a lot more focused, perhaps even robotic. Very important at this point, we also want to top off our ammunition and there is also one last source of credits over here that we don't want to miss. Our first artifact is then also just up ahead, but to access it we first need to deactivate its containment system. Well, that's weird looking. Guess we found it. Got the sample. Roger that. Meet you at the landing pad. Alright, on we go, back to the shuttle. So far, things have been going rather smoothly, but of course, we are not quite done just yet. Second sample located, Commander. Nav point updated. Good work. Right, so this is the sample that we passed by earlier, the one near the first log entry. And as you can see, it is also once again guarded, with enemies that conveniently enough only activate once we have reached this stage in the mission. Among them are once again a centurion and a few assault troopers, but also a new type of enemy that we have not yet faced, who is actually the source of the turret that you maybe saw briefly in the back there. For the moment though, the assault troopers are engaging first and with little success. 
Without any sort of shield or armor, they can immediately be lifted by singularity and pose no threat to us whatsoever, provided we can catch them before they can lob their grenades. At this stage in the fight, we now only have two enemies left, two combat engineers. Offensively, they are not that strong and are only equipped with a pistol, but they can deploy a dangerous turret, while defensively they have a moderate amount of shields, making them a little bit more tricky to take out than the standard trooper. By the way, that turret that an engineer can deploy is actually carried around on their back, and it goes up in a quite violent explosion if the engineer is killed before using it, as you can see here. The other turret, meanwhile, has already been destroyed, perhaps even in the explosion. In any case, the coast is now clear, and we can once again stock up on ammo and then retrieve the second artifact. However, as soon as we start deactivating the containment system, two assault troopers drop down from above, but a quick singularity takes care of them. It appears to be Reaper tech, but no signature is new to me. And with that, we can now grab the artifact. Ten. Second sample secure. Heading back to you now. We just need to hold out until Cortez can pick us up. Nothing like having your back to the wall. Never said it would be easy. Okay, so our mission has changed somewhat now. While we were previously fighting our way through to the artifacts inside, we now have to hold out and wait for extraction. And while we grab ourselves another lovely headshot through the Guardian's shield here, number 7 so far, with number 8 following shortly, let's talk strategy. Although, if you are hoping for an elaborate plan, I am afraid I have to disappoint you. Simply staying right where we are usually works quite nicely. As our enemies don't have that many approach angles, we have a fairly unobstructed line of sight and, very importantly, a respawning crate of ammunition right next to us. Still, from time to time, it can make sense to advance a bit and land a few shots or a singularity on one of the unprotected troopers just to slow down the enemy's advance. Stay focused. This isn't over yet. I can do this all day. What makes our mission a little bit more difficult is then also the fact that a good portion of our enemies are now actually Cerberus Centurions who have shields, and apart from disruptor ammo, we have no abilities whatsoever dedicated to stripping those away. Luckily though, one well-placed shot with the sniper rifle is usually enough to take care of those shields, at which point we can then deploy Singularity and handle any Centurion like a regular trooper. Still, as you can see, this is a fairly defensive-minded approach in which we have to be patient and take on one enemy after the other. Our lack of attack powers at this point is, by the way, also the reason why I would actually not recommend doing this mission this early in the game, unless, of course, you are playing a Shepard with attack powers like Overload. Cortez, do you copy? What's your status? Engaging multiple targets. Time for something a bit risky. Lieutenant! Last stand, Commander. Just stay focused and keep at it. Right, now after we saw Cortez do a quick flyby, we can focus back on the situation at hand, which is certainly not getting any easier. Up until now, we have been pretty lucky that our enemies have all chosen the direct approach from the front, where we can snipe them off easily, but with their numbers increasing, a flanking maneuver from the left side is becoming more and more likely. Case in point, a lone assault trooper has snuck up on us and forces us now to briefly divide our attention between two fronts. And this fairly tactical element to the mission and to the map that it takes place on is no coincidence. This map was actually also a map for the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer, as a matter of fact, the smallest of all available ones, and like I said earlier, one that focuses heavily on close quarters combat. To that end, it might also seem somewhat counterintuitive to bring a sniper rifle along, but I would like to unlock the mail slot achievement as quickly as possible, so killing a few more guardians through their shields is necessary, and the sniper rifle is by far the easiest weapon to do that with. Once that achievement has been unlocked though, we can then treat the guardians just like any other assault troopers, their shield does not actually offer them any protection against biotics, so they are just as vulnerable to singularity. By the way, those short bits of radio chatter with Cortez are not just ambient dialogue, they are actually also progress markers triggered after a certain number of enemies have been eliminated. 
And the fact that we have now gone quite some time without anyone talking to us also tells us that this current wave of enemies is in fact a little bit more on the larger side. Cortez, do you copy? I hope he's still alive. He'll make it. Let's just keep the landing pad clear. Right, now this is the progress update that we have been waiting for, as we are now prompted to move back towards the landing pad. However, make no mistake about it, this is where the mission goes from difficult to dicey, as we are of course also giving up a fairly solid defensive position. Liara actually going down here only underlines that, although unlike in Mass Effect 1 and 2, we have the option to manually revive her without the need for Medigel. This is a mechanic that I believe was also part of the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer, and it is of course still present in many multiplayer shooters today. If we are not in a position to reach a fallen squad member though, we can also still bring them back using the old way, formerly known as Unity, now named First Aid, but still consuming one dose of Medigel. Heading for extraction point now. Okay, this is our call to get ready for the extraction, but don't take this the wrong way. It does actually take a little while for Cortez to arrive, and the landing pad is about to be swarming with enemies. For the moment, things are looking rather quiet, but believe me, that is going to change. If you are wondering, by the way, why we only obtained two of the four artifacts that are at least visually present on the map, then I unfortunately have no answer to that. All I can say is that it's always these two that need to be grabbed. The fact that there are four of them on the map is likely also a leftover from the multiplayer version of this map. I didn't play that a whole lot, but I think I remember there being a match type where you had to disable four devices. Maybe these four were used for that. But enough with the speculation, as you can see Cortez is taking his sweet time and we are stumbling from one precarious situation to the next, which actually forces me to use some Medigel here, something I believe we never or just very rarely did back in Mass Effect 1 and 2. But with Mass Effect 3 ramping up the action shooter elements a bit, and with our shields barely withstanding more than a single enemy hit on insanity difficulty, this is almost unavoidable, at least on maps like this where evading enemies is not always possible. And yes, that is once again a very good argument for saving this map until we are a bit more powerful, or at least have access to a wider variety of squad members. But being rather short, it simply fit very nicely at the end of this episode, which is why I included it here today. And there we go, Cortez is finally here, let's run for safety, ignoring all remaining enemies and finally escape. Commander, we've got our best engineers looking at the Reaper tech you secured from that lab. What was Cerberus doing with it? We don't know yet, but whatever Cerberus is up to, it can't be good. Even if we can't determine its purpose, we've disrupted their experiments. I doubt they'll just close up shop. Agreed. We'll keep sending strikes against the facility. Good work, Commander. Okay, so there we are, with our first small side mission completed and a further 10,000 credits transferred to our account. I hope that these last 10 to 15 minutes of action were able to make up for another rather dialogue heavy episode. At the very least, I can promise that the next one is going to be a bit more action packed. Speaking of the next episode, I just want to quickly mention that I will be on holiday next week, so that next episode is likely going to come out the week after that. On the bright side though, maybe that gives you a bit of time to catch up with the other series on the channel, perhaps even our Mass Effect 1 and 2 playthroughs to get you back up to speed. In any case, I hope you enjoyed today's video and if you did, then I would of course be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. Also, if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course go ahead and subscribe if you haven't done so already, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.